okay, I can't promise I'm going to entertain. That's not really in my nature. Um, PhD economists at universities aren't really wired to do that. So I'm going to fail on that front. My goal here is to talk about a specific tool that's available on Ag Manager, hopefully make some of you aware of it. Those of you who are already aware of it, maybe a little more comfortable with it and give you an example of how to use it. The broader goal here would be to help you get a little more comfortable with thinking about risk and maybe understanding why producers don't hedge more than they do is one of the punchlines from this. So I'm going to focus on feeder cattle price risk to make the points, but I would submit almost all the concepts I'm talking about apply corn price risk management and you guys can follow the examples. So first it's important to recognize risk is both good and bad. It just depends on who you are in the story. Michael just got done talking about low commodity prices. That's actually not bad if you are an elevator that can procure high volumes of grain and you make your money on volume, right? So one situation is good for one person, is bad for another in many, many cases. That's important to keep in mind. A couple specific examples here. Again, I'm going to use kettle many times here. I put out a monthly barometer of trends in feedlot profitability based upon some uh, focus on feedlot data and lots of market information. We estimate May of 2017 was the best ever in terms of closeouts and feedlots. But underneath that is somebody that did not hedge the cattle and did not hedge the corn when they bought those cattle six, seven months before that, okay? That exact same person would have missed out on that record closeout month had they engaged in price risk management. So had they priced the fed cattle when they placed the feeders in the yard, they would not be looking at May of 2017 as the best month they've ever had, okay? So you can't have it both ways is kind of the point. At the same time, somebody that regularly hedges at least some percentage of their animals when they place would have avoided December of 2015 was the worst month ever in my series. So somebody that's avoiding those downside risks doesn't get the benefit of the upside and vice versa. I think you guys get that, but we all need to remind producers it's very hard to time and be cherry picking, right, to protect against the down, but be fully exposed to the good up. That's next to impossible to do routinely. Everybody gets lucky and does it right every once in a while, but over a multi-year decision pattern, I submit nobody's that good myself included. I don't think anybody's lying to you if they think they can do that regularly. It's not just price risk. I'm going to talk about price risk, but you have yield risk on the crop front, of course. In the animal front, we have animal health and performance risk. And to make you think a little bit broader about is animal health performance good or bad, it depends on what you talk about. One of the reasons cattle producers had a good 2014 was pork producers had an animal health problem. So PEDV knocked out an awful lot of wean pigs, the result of that was we had fewer market hogs. The result of that was we had less pork to sell. That was supportive of the beef complex. So an animal health event in one case was really bad for the pork industry. Wasn't good for the animal health in the cattle industry, but was good for profitability in the cattle industry. So I want you to think about risk as both good and bad. It just depends on what side of the table you sit on. I think you guys probably get that, but you got to keep that in mind in all your discussions. Okay? The other one down at the bottom, anything in production ag, you have to absorb some risk, otherwise you wouldn't be in business. It's next to impossible to run a feed yard or run a cow-calf business or plant corn and hedge away all risk and pay the bills. Yes, there's some individual cases when you could do that, but routinely, the market does not encourage us guaranteed returns over and over and over to where you could do that. If it did, geeks like dentists and K-State faculty that Michael was talking about would come in and bid it away so that wasn't the case. Right? If I was able to hedge a $30 positive return in a feed yard all the time, I'd pay more for those feeders and I'd drive that down to zero. Right? And I wouldn't be the only one. There'd be several doing that. Right? So keep that in mind is absorbing some of the risk is just a necessity of being an ag. So that comes with these volatile swings in the markets and profitability. So for today's discussion, I want to hone in on one specific tool, price risk, feeder cattle price risk specifically. And please ask me any questions as we go here. So this is a timely one. Um, how many have seen this, let's get the laser to work, hopefully, at the bottom, this feeder cattle risk management tool, an Excel tool that's on Ag Manager. A few of you, at least a couple of you call and quiz me about it, but maybe not all of you are aware of it. So step one is to make you aware it exists. Uh, Kevin Duvetter, who most of you know, or at least heard about if you're newer to the scene, uh, originally built this. I kind of maintain it and update it over time. But the whole point of that particular tool, and I'm gonna show it to you here, is to compare expected net selling prices, in this case for feeder cattle, under different situations, okay? I'm gonna give you a couple specific examples. When I pulled this together for the handouts on, what was that, Thursday, is that the fourth? I did a what if situation based upon Dodge City. So when I was doing this last week, the situation was for this coming Wednesday, 
I'm interested in possibly buying a five and a half weight steer, which this is the time of year that you could do this. And I'm considering putting 300 pounds on between now and March. So this is just one example of buying a calf, pushing it out to a yearling. I'm gonna add those 300 pounds over that period. In order to understand if that's a good move or not, we need to do a few things. So I use this beefbasis.com tool to project the buy and sell price. So to the right hand side, you'll see last week I was projecting 160 and change is what's gonna take to buy that animal this week. And then out in March, projecting 138 to sell it. The difference in those two tells you how much value is added to that animal. The value of gains, 96 bucks per hundred weight, $289 total for that animal, so you're adding 300 pounds. Before you pull the trigger on this, do I or don't I engage in it, you need to know something about your cost. So what's it gonna cost you to put those 300 pounds on? For cowboy math for a moment, let's just say it's gonna take me $60 per hundred weight cost. That's within five bucks of being reasonable, I think, so let's just use 60 for a moment. 96 minus 60 is a positive $26 margin per hundred pounds. We're putting 300 on, that's $78 per head, expected net gain, right? Revenue added, less the cost of doing it. There's a lot of variability underneath that, but that's our best guess at the positive margin, is you would net 78 bucks if you engaged in this. What I want you to think about is, okay, given that best guess, first of all, recognize there's a lot of variation in cost. I made it real simple for a moment, just said 60 bucks. So you all need to recognize that when you talk to people. But let's ignore that for today. What if somebody is, excited about that 78 bucks, but they're not excited about the price risk on the March sell. And that's a real possibility, right? So they're interested in engaging in this when they want to protect some of that 78 bucks, but they want to know how much they got to give up to protect it. And they want to know, quote unquote, how best to protect it, okay? So this tool is all designed around protecting a future sell of a feeder animal, in this case for March at 850 pounds. So, there's a few different things you could do. And I purposely picked a small operation example here. So at the top I say case of 30 head. So this is a pretty small, now this would apply to somebody that has 40 cows and they're considering keeping their own calf crop. Right, you could do the exact same scenario I'm talking about, they just don't wanna sell. So now they've got 30 head to manage through this enterprise that I'm talking about. Their alternatives would be do nothing, which is option D, that's the cash strategy, just see what happens in March. And let's consider that the default, because that's what the bulk do, and that's what we're gonna compare everything against. You could purchase an LRP contract, which is Livestock Revenue Protection, USDA-based insurance product. And I'll give you a few details on that. You could hedge on a futures contract, or you could purchase a put option, which is tied to those futures contracts. So those are basically the strategies or alternatives that you can engage in that are related to that future March sale of an 850 pound. When I did this last week, I wish this laser was stronger, so I'll just come up here to it. The March feeder cattle contract was just below 150. The market's up a little bit then since then, but ignore that, because all these things kind of move together in that story. Our expected basis is minus 12. It's negative because we have a heavier animal than that futures contract, so basis becomes negative at that point. Equates to an expected cash price of 138, which you saw on the last slide, okay? The LRP coverage price I chose was 140 and change. You'd have to pay four bucks per hundred weight to do that. So on an eight and a half pound, you'd be paying 30, what, 35 bucks to protect that animal. There's half your expected margin. So before I go any further, risk protection is not free, right? Positive margin, 78 bucks. You go the LRP route, you have to give half of that away to protect it. I'm not saying nobody should do it. I'm just gonna tell you that's part of the reason not everybody wants to do it. The March put option is basically the same premium, because they're tied together the way LRP's priced. LRP's actually priced off those contracts. If you pull up this tool, I basically have already auto-populated it for this slide. You could update this Excel file on your own. But this is a chart, and I, I like how this works, is it basically plots out what the end result net selling prices will be under different conditions where that futures contract changes to. So keep in mind, we were at 150, down here on the bottom is the futures prices and then here vertically is your net selling price. There's a whole cluster of lines right in the middle at about 150, because that's our current best guess of what that contract's gonna be, okay? So there's not a lot of movement right here. What's instructive from an education perspective here today, as well as with producers, is how things change if the market crashes or if the market rallies, because then you can understand how these tools work, okay? So the green line on here is cash, and it's basically a 45 degree angle, and it will be that way on the two or three slides I'm gonna show you. That's the take whatever the market's offering your strategy, 
And basically, if the contract drops by 10 bucks, your cash price you receive will be 10 bucks lower than you expected. If the contract goes up by 10 bucks, your cash price we're expecting to be 10 bucks more up because I've ignored basis risk. I've held that at minus 12 bucks in that story. That's why that's a constant line. So somebody that does not protect will experience that green line is the point, okay? The red line, which is the reverse slope, is the futures hedge one. And this looks a little squirrely because you normally don't see lines like this, but the reason that futures red line is that way is you effectively have taken a position on twice as many animals as you own. Feeder cattle contracts 50,000 pounds. You don't need that much coverage for 30 head, but you can't buy half a futures contract. So if the market crashes, and by the way, I'm not projecting a $40 decline, it's just to make the examples easy. If we go from 150 to 110, you'd actually make a lot of money had you put a futures hedge on because you protected your 30 head and you were a net speculator on the balance and you benefited from the market crash because you made a lot of money on the board in Chicago. That's why this is a really high number. Conversely, if the market really rallies, let's say it goes up 40 bucks, you can't even see because I hit it, the red line's down here, you wouldn't do very well because you did well on the 30 head that you protected, but the board moved opposite of your position, so you'd be giving more than that up to Chicago, okay? The purpose of LRP, and I'm not pushing LRP, I'm just telling you the reason it's on here, is the blue line, which is flat here, and then it has a slope that mirrors the green cash line. So the LRP is an option, basically, protection. So it protects you against a drop, and you can choose the number of head to protect. That's the unique part of this. So you could choose to protect the 30 head, which is what I have listed here to make sure you're clear. So if the market falls, you basically established a floor. That's why the blue line's flat. If the market rallies, it mirrors the cash market, but you're always gonna be a little bit worse because you paid a premium for that coverage. Does everybody follow the basic concept there? What I want you to take from this is, LRP you can match to your herd size, as long as it's less than 1,000 head per time you do it, and less than 2,000 for the year, which for most operations we work with in these stories, that's gonna apply. And if you have a futures or a put approach, which is tied to the same contract size, you gotta be cognizant of the fact that you actually have taken a position that never matches perfectly your reality of number of head involved. So you can have a really good outcome for all the wrong reasons or a really bad outcome for all the wrong reasons because your position doesn't match your real world production position, okay? Here's a table that maps that same stuff out that's underneath that chart. This is the one that might be easy to understand, but I purposely started extreme, hopefully to get your attention. This is the case, just same situation, but instead, let's say I have 65 head. So now we're getting close to the size of the futures contract. And now you can see these lines aren't quite as extreme. The red line is close to flat because a futures hedge basically establishes a flat price. Whether the market goes up or not, I have a constant expected price. The only thing that varies my net price is if basis change from what I expected. There's a slight slope on this because it doesn't match perfectly, right? But it's pretty flat. Likewise, all these other lines are fairly flat because they're tied to the contract size. And the LRP line, the blue line, and the green line, they are the same on this chart for 65 head as they are the previous one for 30 because you take the same position just to match your operation size. So they don't change. Hopefully I'm getting across to you the futures contracts, the put options tied to them, and the more complicated strategies that involve options. They all, those lines move a lot if you're taking a position on the board that doesn't match with your production numbers. That's what I'm trying to get across to you on the intent of LRP and why some people might be interested in it. But at the same time, hopefully you follow perhaps the most important point is in this story, you'd have to pay roughly 35 bucks per head to establish that LRP or a put option protection. And you had a expected net margin of what I say, 78 bucks. So you'd be giving away half of the expected margin to protect that output price. And I'm not saying nobody shouldn't do it because you still would have an expected positive margin, but a lot of people don't get excited about giving away half the expected margin to protect. So it's fairly rational that people don't get excited about these things. And I think it's why, among other reasons, that a lot of people default to the green, I'll just take what the market gives me. Because sometimes they're rewarded quite well for that, sometimes they're not, All right? Any questions on that before I leave it? So I hope I've made you aware of the tool and maybe you have a little bit better feel for how it works. Um, that particular situation I did because we're sitting here in October, it fits the October to March feeder cattle frame. Had we been here four months ago, 
I would have given you a situation for somebody interested in selling a November or October calf, the exact same mechanics work, right? So you can actually use this tool all year long. You'll just use it obviously for different points in the you know, cattle production cycle. So somebody that's interested in protecting their calf crop, the exact same exercise can be done, let's say in April, when they're starting to think about it, when they got calves on the ground and they have some sense of how many they're gonna have to sell. You could walk them through the exact same thing of what are their alternatives and what would it cost them to protect October, November weaning kind of sales. So the mechanics are the same. You just change the upfront weight of animals and how many head and so forth to match the situation. Last point, LRP details are on this slide. I include it just to remind me to tell you guys, you get coverage for 13 weeks out up to one year out. So you cannot use the LRP contract to protect something this coming November today. I can't engage in a contract to protect the next month of movement. You've got to go 13 weeks out. So this tool is not designed for, let's say you have a really good rally in the market and I want to lock something in to sell it a month from now. You could take a position in Chicago, futures contracts, options, put options, and so forth. You couldn't do the put options that are mimicked by LRP. So it's not meant for a shorter term, right? It's 13 weeks up to a year. That's important because every once in a while I'll get a producer ask me, can I buy it for a month from now? It's not eligible for that point, okay? That's correct. Um, so Jared's pointing out, you can't even, um, there's only certain days that you can pick LRP coverage for, and for almost nobody do they align with the expected actual sale date. So you've got also another temporal risk, is the day that you choose on your LRP contract might be 10 days before or after, or maybe more than 10, from when you actually sell the cattle. So you're gonna be exposed in a good or a bad way because of that. Conversely, I could take an offsetting position on my Chicago exposure, if I have futures contractor put option, to match that day. What I'm trying to highlight to you is then you've gotta be cognizant of the number of head differences. So I don't really have a personal favorite, that's not the point of this. I'm just trying to illustrate to everybody they all have pros and cons too though. And thank you for that reminder, Jerry. That's another complaint about that. This right here, I've included two slides, basically just to make the point about risk reward trade-off, because I think it's useful to keep that in mind when you think about price risk stuff. John Lawrence uh, was an economist colleague who's now went to the dark side of administration at Iowa State, but he would be my parallel at Iowa State until he went into administration. He did a study, and this is old info, I'm gonna show you an update in a minute, but he looked at fed cattle pricing in Iowa, 1987 to 2006, and what they compared was basically these different strategies. So now we're in a feedlot mindset, but the cash strategy, do nothing, just take the cash price that's offered to us. Future strategy, hedge all those fed cattle when we place them in a yard, 50-50, so hedge half the animals when we place them, and then some more complicated option strategies. Over that time period, this is a summary, and you guys have the numbers in front of you, of how those strategies compared. So if you just took what the market gave you, had a cash strategy approach, on average over that period, positive return of two bucks and 76 cents per head. Sorry, per hundred weight. What I want you to note is the standard deviation, which is our kind of measure of how volatile those returns are, is 8.3. The row right below it, which is the futures hedge, the average return is negative. It's small, but nonetheless it's negative. But the standard deviation is much lower. So this is a classic, very simple risk reward trade-off. If you want to get rid of all the risk, you give away some of the average returns. So we went from two point whatever, seven down to small negative, and you cut your risk exposure way down. These other options like half futures or the put options fall in between that. But this is just a simple example of the market regularly works such that if you expose yourself fully to risk, long term over multiple lots of cattle sold in this story, your average return I think will be higher. And I still believe that today. But you have to recognize you're gonna have a lot more risk exposure. You're gonna have individual months that are really good and individual months that are really bad. So you'll be rewarded long-term if you've got an equity position and a lender behind you to ride out the highs and lows. That doesn't apply to everybody, right? But it's not free to go and protect yourself, which hopefully you follow from the last example. Here's information from Eric Belasco, an economist colleague. Uh, Michael had the pleasure of studying with him, so overlapped at North Carolina State. That's a small world we live in, but he, he's done some work. Uh, this actually goes back, I think, to his days at North Carolina trying to summarize feedlot profitability. And here I want you to understand the impact of health risk and then price risk mitigation on feedlot returns. So he, he had Kansas and Nebraska feedlot data, 1995, 2004, it doesn't really matter those details, this is just raw data he had access to. In the case where they had no price risk 
protection, they lost 360, or not 360, three dollars and 61 cents. So close to break even. Sidebar, you're picking up on a theme. Lots of things in the feedlot industry, the average returns are close to zero with a lot of volatility around it. So it's a complicated enterprise to deal with. But those returns change a lot if you have a high mortality event. So you lose 31 more bucks per head if you have an unfortunate animal health event. And then they vary a lot depending on performance. So average daily gain being low or high, high average daily gain is obviously good, right? You can actually get a positive return. And if it's low, that's bad, you get a more negative return. Here's an example of animal performance risk varying the net return that's realized. If you want to understand how some people survive in the feedlot world, over time, people get better at managing right here. The survivors in the feedlot industry are better than the non-survivors at getting performance out of cattle. Now, there's lots of ways to do that, right? But getting better than average on animal health risk, performance risk, and so forth, is basically a survival tactic for the feedlot industry. If you want to understand, this is, uh, you guys have the handout, you can see it better there than on the screen, but how the profit distribution changes when you engage in protection, what you can see right here is there's a line that says no price protection, and it's really short and it's really wide. So over time, if you do not protect fed cattle, feeder cattle, or corn prices, these are close to zero on average returns, but you'll notice it spans from minus 500 to plus 500. And by the way, the series I maintain here for Kansas is the same story. December of 2015 to uh, May of 2017, we went minus 500 to plus almost 500. So there's a lot of variability if you're fully exposed to feeder cattle, fed cattle, and corn prices. But if you protect yourself on one of those legs, so either corn price or fed cattle prices, you don't move the means too much, but you shrink the standard deviations massively on those returns. So these charts right here, those tails come in, and I, I wish you could see it better here, all these become tall and narrow bell curves. So they all still are close to zero returns, but you've lost the potential to make 500 bucks as a trade-off to protect yourself against the loss of 500. Everybody follow that point? Importantly, you didn't move from plus, you know, from break even to plus 100 in doing it. You actually didn't change the mean very much, but you protected the tails. Okay, but protecting the tails isn't free. Remember those four dollar premiums I was talking about on feeder cattle? You'd be paying that and then some on fed cattle, and you'd be paying the equivalent to protect yourself on corn and more broadly your feed cost. So you can get rid of some risk and reduce the range of likely outcomes, but you can't do it for free. That's the common story here, okay? Um, I've made those points. Let's take some questions. Hopefully I accomplished my goal. I wanna expose you to that feeder cattle pricing tool because I think it's a good one that do better built. I just try to update it periodically. Um, some of you in the room call me because I know you use it. The others that don't, now you're aware of it. I hope you utilize it. No questions? Yes? I think they talked to the lender. So when you talk weather event, you got to know if it was small and isolated or broad. Because if it's a broad one that actually knocks out or has a big, big impact, then you could have a fed cattle price impact. That's important, right? So if you had the whole state of Nebraska that had a bad week, so the entire, all the animals on feed then took a performance hit and maybe a death loss hit, you would actually see a Nebraska fed cattle price benefit from that because you have an aggregate supply hit. Does that make sense? If you tell me there's one county in Nebraska that has 5,000 head on feed, that's a really bad story for the guy that has those 5,000 head, but the Nebraska cattle price won't change. So the first thing is to understand that, because that event actually may not be that bad if everybody around you experienced it, and you can get an output price benefit. If it's a small isolated one in your hit, then there's no output price benefit, but yet you obviously have a production hit that comes with it. They survive because they had equity they're eating into, or they go to their lender and they live for another day, or at the extreme, they no longer operate, right? That'd be the worst worst. You don't see much of that latter one, mainly because a feedlot, this is a, an opinion I can't prove, I'll just tell you why I think you see people keep surviving. Feedlots are for one purpose, to feed cattle. So even if that operation has that bad event, the lender behind them doesn't really like the options of if I take it from him, what am I gonna do with it? Somebody else is gonna feed cattle. 
it's not like a new Chevy pickup that if you aren't making the payments, I can take it from you and sell it to somebody that night. I mean, I might take a thousand dollar hit, but I can find a market for it. You can't do that with something that's a single purpose feedlot. So I think lenders actually give more rope than we assume they would is the point because they don't like the option of having it on their books. Well, particularly in the case of a one isolated weather event, because that's that particular one's not an example of bad management or anything else. That's just crappy luck. The store storm hit you, right? If regularly they see you're always 10 bucks per hundred weight higher cost of gain than everybody else, at some point they're going to cut you off, right? Because that's a longer management issue. But if it's an isolated weather one like you asked me on, I honestly think just talking with a lender, they'll play for another day because they don't like the other option. Even if they take it from you, they got to bring somebody back in to run it, and downtime is expensive too. But big equity hit still occurs in that story, right? You still obviously lose personally. Good question. So in a roundabout way, if you have an adverse weather event, you it's not really Christian to do it, but you should pray for everybody in the surrounding states to get it too. <laughs> Any other comments? By the way, I don't do that, but hopefully you understand the logic behind that comment. <laughs> okay, thank you.